founder CEO of WMDSF Magazine. And I'm here at the Handcrafting Justice Organization, a nonprofit organization that helps women and men across the globe, helping to improve their status out of poverty. We're going to have an interview and tour the facility and tune in. And we're here at the Handcrafting Justice, and I'm sitting here with Boreen McGowan, I'm a sister of the Good Shepherd, and we, I want to welcome you to Handcrafting Justice and thank you for your interest in fair trade, nonprofit, and women from Asia, Africa, and South America. And I want to thank you for having us here. So we're going to start off by asking, can you just tell us a little bit about what Handcrafting Justice is? Absolutely. <clears throat> Handcrafting Justice is a nonprofit fair trade organization. We work with women, uh, enterprising women, from Asia, Africa, and South America. We're sponsored by the Sisters of the Good Shepherd, a Catholic community of sisters that have a privilege of having a presence in all of these countries. The Good Shepherd sisters in these countries are women of Thailand, women of Peru, women of Kenya. And they have created centers, we might refer to them as social service centers, for women in need. Our focus in those centers is uh, multi-pronged, uh, giving women a space and an opportunity to come together uh, for empowerment, uh, for healing if necessary, and for economic justice. The uh, handcrafting justice is the marketing um, behind the income generating projects. Okay. And, um when did it start? When did you guys start? Doing in 1997, Handcrafting Justice was created a board of directors, became a 501c3, and was at that point able to market our goods here in the United States. We market from New York all the way across to Los Angeles. Oh, wow. We have about 22 sales reps that women and men who uh, resonate with this mission of economic justice and sell the goods on behalf of handcrafting justice in venues in their area. Okay. And the founder of the organization was? Uh, myself along with other uh, Sisters of the Good Shepherd who had the same insight, the same passion, mm -hmm. and the same commitment to uh, women around the world. Uh, we met women, Sisters of the Good Shepherd, in, at, uh, internationally, and we, they brought us the products, and we saw right away that it was an opportunity to educate people here in the United States on the plight of women. Most of us know that uh, the feminization of poverty today is reflected in so many ways. We know that 70% of all people in the United States, in around the world, are uh, are women, women who are poor, mm -hmm. women who are living in grinding, grinding poverty, because of the lack of resources, very fundamental resources. Right. So that would explain why you were encouraged to start the organization. In the Correct. First place. Yes. Okay, yes. Yeah. So I know you mentioned Haiti. What are the other countries that you guys work at, all the centers? Well, there's 20 countries, yeah. so 50 projects. Uh, every day we're privileged to work with uh, a very conservative es estimate is 6,000 women mm. every day participate in the work of handcrafting justice. Right. Wow. Um, how do you perform outreach within the countries? Every, because we are the marketers, mm -hmm. Our focus is marketing here in the United States. Uh, we're a fair trade organization, and I know that you know that that means that our producers are paid a fair and honest wage. We have an opportunity to speak with the producers, to speak with the projects that organize them. We can see we've been there, so we see the working conditions. We sp we've spoken with the women's. We have done. Um, personal interviews with women and uh, without a doubt, uh, with no contest, <laughs> we can say that the markets of handcrafting justice, uh, any markets that our women can participate in has created an environment, 
uh, an improved environment for these women. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really the projects that the women come to that do the outreach. Our part is to market for them, okay. but we have seen them do that at our outreach. I've been back to countries mm -hmm. after a, a three year lapse, and when I was there first, I could see homes or shanty little um, uh, houses with no roofs or just with the blue tarp. And I've gone back and now there's a roof there or a stove or a bathroom. Mm -hmm. So it, it's very foundational. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And um, I understand that those who create their own homemade products are addressed as artisans. Um, how do the artisans qualify to be part of the project? They really qualify themselves. Mm -hmm. So it's about self-motivation, mm -hmm. about self-empowerment. Mm -hmm. So they come to the centers because they have identified that they have needs. Mm -hmm. And they've heard that there are these centers, we might call them social service centers, self-help centers, mm -hmm. training centers here in the United States. So the women identify themselves, they choose to come. Why they're there, they're offered any host of services. Mm -hmm. Could be education, could be individual therapy, could be group, self-help groups, could be nutrition, could be an opportunity for reflection, spiritual devel development in whatever religion they choose uh, to participate in. Uh, and the one of the choices are these economic uh, income generating projects, which of course most 90% of the women choose to participate in because it improves their uh, living conditions. Exactly. Exactly. So do, I know you educate the people who produce, do you also educate the children as well? Is that okay? We, our education for the, our artisans mm -hmm. would be vocational, mm -hmm. uh, would be literacy in their language, mm -hmm. uh, would be skill based. We wouldn't be offering a um, high school diploma right, or right. a college diploma for the artisans. Okay. Now for the children, it's mostly daycare centers. Okay. So it's from very, very little toddlers till about three or four or five years old. Okay. Uh, so it's, and it's an opportunity for these children to get three meals a day, to, get, uh, to be able to participate with other, other children, sing songs, use their creative, uh, nature uh, and to learn when they're the impact of early childhood education I think none of us need to, you know exactly. convincing <laughs> convincing on exactly so, yeah. um, is the project open to everyone in the community and not in the countries that you aid to yes we, we don't discriminate on cultural or nationality or religious I mean we are a, a, a Catholic group of sisters sisters mm -hmm. of the Good Shepherd uh, but our projects do not discriminate. So I've certainly been to the centers in Thailand where it's mostly Buddhist, mm -hmm. and they'll have the Buddha right there, <laughs> and then the picture of the Blessed Mother and <laughs> Sacred Heart right there. Right. They start every day with a moment of silence, a moment of prayer in their own faith. Same thing in India, same thing in uh, Kenya or Senegal or you know the, the Muslim countries. They're uh, supported, encouraged, to bring that faith deeper into their lives and of course to their to their families. Right. Okay. What are some of the background stories from the women that you have aided in the service? Well, you know, maybe we can tell the stories through the products. Right. So this little doll, we call it the Flopsy doll. Yeah. Uh, this is made by young women in uh, Kenya. These young women have uh, most of them live on their own. Most of them are raising their brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. Their parents already have uh, deceased from AIDS. Mm -hmm. These women live in one of the biggest slums in Nairobi. They come to the center every day. They get a minimum stipend. Mm -hmm. They learn how to create these beautiful products. Mm -hmm. All the material is donated material that they learn how to sew, how to put together and um, be able to create an income. As I say, that income not only is for them, mm -hmm. but for, the, uh, for their brothers and sisters who, who they're raising. Mm -hmm. So 
and all throughout Africa and Senegal, uh, we are in Senegal and Burkina Faso, mm -hmm. many of the young girls are victims of uh, female uh, gen uh, genital mutilation mm -hmm. and uh, they're needing to uh, escape from their environment. They're needing to educate their parents and needing support, outside support. So coming to centers, getting the support of, of women, helping to educate their families, because obviously they want to be with their families. Mm -hmm. So these are the kinds of issues that women around the world and women that uh, we are privileged to work with are, are dealing with. In uh, Thailand, mm -hmm. uh, the Good Shepherd Sisters work in a Fatima Self-Help Center. Mm -hmm. And uh, this little doll, the mm -hmm. uh, Little Red Riding Hood, I know everyone has recognized her. And there's the grandma, <laughs> and there's the wolf. So this <laughs> great little educational toy, you know, it's the, yeah. really is the hope and dream of, of women around the world, women who have told me over and over again through the markets of handcrafting justice they can now feed their Just children. Yeah. They can now educate their, their children. Yes, These yes. particular women in Thailand are the poorest of the poor. They don't even live in the slum. They live, uh, as you probably know, Bangkok is made up of canals. Mm -hmm. And they put planks out on the canal and then a tarp and these women who have moved in from the countryside are living really over the canals. They come into the center to begin to heal, mm -hmm. to begin to receive services, begin to create products mm -hmm. where they can now receive a, um, a meaningful uh, fair wage. Mm -hmm. And through the income that they're able to receive and their children are able to go to daycare, they can move then from the canal into what we would might call the slums and that is a step up. It might be just a little cinder block room but it's, it's, it's at least safe. Their yeah. child is not going to drown. So, uh, so these are some of the, the many, many stories. We have the privilege of, of working with women in um, the Philippines. Mm -hmm. And these women belong to a, a co-op mm -hmm. called uh, Alacapua. And there's a few hundred families that belong that once they've earned enough money and they can move out of the slums uh, away, they can t continue to create products and continue to market because markets are the big issue for many, many uh, craftspeople in the developing world. They have no markets where they where they live. So this particular product and this one here, th this is re a recycled telephone directory <laughs> bag. So these families literally live in the dumps of Manila mm. and they organize themselves, very entrepreneurial, <laughs> and uh, they, you take one section, you take section A, B, and C. And then the families come and they take products that are pieces of material that can be reused. Mm -hmm. And they create these beautiful yeah. bags from the telephone directories that you and I discard. And they make these beautiful chip bags out of the potato chip wrap wrappers that you and I discard. <laughs> so this is a meaningful income for these families. And through the markets of handcrafting justice, they have... Uh, been able to increase their production 58%. Yeah. So their children not, now not only can attend elementary school and high school, but some of these children now are going to college. Yeah. So it's, it's really quite a story yeah. when, it, when you're speaking to the individual. It's making an impact on the lives of women whose children now have opportunities that they've never had. Is there an age for these women that they're able to join? Or no. is it any age? It's any whatever, age? again, it's self-driven. Right. Right. So it's when they, Feel you know, ready. they can learn the skill and move on. Right. You know, that's, that's fine, exactly. that's fine. So it's, it's a lot of self-motivation. 
And uh, when we were talking about working with men and with boys, in fact, I, in June, I had the privilege of being with the boys who created this beautiful uh, piece of art from Haiti. Uh, these are um, artisans of the forest, is what they call themselves. And each one has their story uh, in the back here. Uh, but basically, these young men who are, have, there's no employment, I mean, as you, I don't know if you've ever been to Haiti, but it gives new meaning to poverty, and the infrastructure is and just so, yeah, the infrastructure is so uh, diminished, and I sat with the boys, and I asked them to tell me about what they drew, drew what, what they draw here and what they paint. Mm -hmm. And they basically told me it was their environment, what they saw their, their mothers in the marketplace, their aunties in the marketplace, and, and so on. And then they whispered. They said, you know, we don't really see all of those trees, but we know that there, it was one point that we had a lot of these trees. Mm -hmm. And we put these trees in the environment because we, this is our hope for our country. Mm -hmm. So they're young people that are very aware, they're very bright, very talented, and given an opportunity to express themselves, I think they've done a fabulous yeah, job yeah. when you, when you see this, this beautiful yeah. painting. Yeah, it's really great work. And if uh, anyone wants to see more of the pieces, they can come to our website right. on handcraftingjustice.org and see the beautiful work of women's hands. Exactly. And uh, what are some of the challenges that you guys have faced along the way? Well, as marketers, uh, it's the, the competition is uh, really staggering. Right. Uh, you have so the market is flooded with very, very inexpensive, not very well produced <laughs> goods from China right. or from other places that are made not with a fair trade uh, uh, salary or, or uh, wage provided. So you're, you're trying to create uh, a actual business so that this market will be available for women, not just today, but in five years and in 10 years. So you're trying to create a structure that is sustainable here in the United States mm -hmm. where rent, overhead <laughs> and so on increasing. so it, that that's a challenge right. but and we're committed we are committed to uh, providing a fair trade uh, fair trade uh, wages for the work that, that we bring in mm -hmm. so that's a it's a big channel uh, challenge is the uh, is the competition but we probably have more blessings than right. challenge. We, we're part of the Fair Trade Federation, which is a membership-driven uh, trade organization that promotes fair trade throughout the United States. Uh, many people un know and understand fair trade coffee and chocolate <laughs> and so on, and that's great. But this is fair trade textiles, fair trade crafts, mm -hmm. and it's the same, the same principles, giving a fair and honest wage, uh, honoring the worker, uh, principles that uh, any any one of us who, who gets up in the morning want to be honored and uh, to be respected as a uh, as a worker. Right. And this is a beautiful piece that you have here. Yes, and then finally, well, before we end, mm -hmm. I, I would like to show you this this beautiful piece. This is ma a mask mm -hmm. from the Huichol Indians in the uh, mountains of Topeque in Mexico. These uh, Indians are obviously very, very talented and very expressive, very creative. They have very few markets. The uh, government of Mexico only releases so many permits for craftspeople to come into the marketplaces in the, in the middle of, of these towns mm -hmm. to come and sell the wares. This community is very remote mm -hmm. and has no opportunity to bring their goods to the, uh, the center of the square, to the market. Many of the women are abused. Uh, tremendous amount of alcoholism and domestic violence. Tremendous around. Uh, the Good Shepherd Sisters were able to provide a community center for the women. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, while they couldn't totally remove them from their home, which what we do here in the States, well, they were able to create a space for the women and for the men during the day to be able to create, use the, the gifts of their hands and create these beautiful huichol. This is a bed of, um, this is carved, mm -hmm. and then a bed of beeswax and placing the beads over, uh, over these um, sculptures. That's good. Yeah. And how much of the proceeds go to the women? Percentage? Well, thank you for asking that. Mm -hmm. uh, the women, number one, the artisans, mm -hmm. they set the prices. So right, right there, we're not telling them you got to make that for five dollars. Yeah. <laughs> They're setting the prices, and then once we receive the goods here, our our partners do not have to wait to be paid. They get paid right away. So it's not thirty days, ninety days, forty five days, or whenever, or when we sell. I mean, right. everything you saw, everything you saw, right. has been paid for. Wow. So That's this amazing. is an incredible. Yeah, that uh, is. So, so the the women receive exactly what they ask for. And uh, then we, as marketers, put a, a margin on it in order for us to cover our overhead. Great. And how is it that others can help in, in the cause? Thank you very much for asking. So, <laughs> I, of course, coming to our website, right. uh, viewing the, the work of women's hands, appreciating the, the work of the women, and then of course, if you have a special occasion, guys, <laughs> a special occasion to buy on our website, handcraftingjustice.org, to shop there, shop early and shop often. Okay. <laughs> uh, we're really putting a big effort into bringing people to the website, hearing the story, seeing the story, seeing the artisans, and being able to connect them with the products that they're they're buying. Because fair trade, you're you're. Uh, honoring whoever you're buying that gift for, right. you're honoring women, you're buying a, fair, uh, a first quality gift uh, for that, that person or that, uh, that you're buying that gift for, and you're um, helping women around the world. So, and then if anyone wanted to have a sale, a, a house sale, or in their local bookstore, or their book club, or their women's group, or their men's group, we have plenty of products, and we're only needing to be asked to connect you to our mission. Uh, you'd be heartily welcome at, <laughs> at any at any time. Okay. Well, yeah. we would like to thank you for taking the time to do the interview with us. Oh, thank you. Um, it's been a blessing, yes. and uh, good luck with uh, you. your magazine. Uh, magazine. <laughs> and I just really applaud you thank for you. Uh, this kind of awareness on uh, women's issues. Thank you. Uh, we, we need it. it. Uh, thank, thank you. you so God bless much. you. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you.